Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us Brandon Riesdorf. Brandon, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on here, Jeffrey. I'm pretty excited. Thanks for the opportunity. Oh, glad to have you. Brandon, your story is so fascinating. For one reason, you're a second generation Scientologist. Yep. Well, actually, third generation. Really? Well, yeah. So my dad uh, was born into Scientology, and my mom, I think when she's two or three, she, her parents got involved with it. I don't know the exact date. Um, but on my dad's side, yeah, I'd be third generation. Wow, that is, that's extremely rare to be third generation. So uh, <laughs> yeah. now, you're, now your mother, Lois Riesdorf, mm -hmm. she was a uh, member of the CMO original CMO. C could, you Correct. could you tell our listeners, for you know, new Scientology watchers, what the CMO was and why L. Ron Hubbard created it? Okay. I, I, I think I understand fully what the CMO is all about. Uh, basically, it's the Commodore Messenger Org, and they would control a lot of the communications um, on behalf of, of L. Ron Hubbard and just ensure that uh, the technology is in place and, and working and uh, they were at one point basically the top of the church, uh, and then obviously Ron would be the, the, the commodore. Um, so it's his org that he was, I guess you'd say, the executive director of that controlled pretty much all of Scientology. Okay, so a few, few clarifications on terms, because a lot of uh, newer listeners don't know Scientology language, Scientology. Okay. And this is really interesting. In... Uh, 1966, L. Ron Hubbard created the Guardian's Office, or what's called the GO. Mm -hmm. And then in 1967, he created the C Organization. Right. Now, he appointed himself the Commodore, and uh, hence the Commodore's Messenger's Organization was to carry Ron's orders. But it, get, right. it gets really funny because CMO were taught to deliver communications from the Commodore in the exact way he delivered them. Yep. Right. So if he, is, if he yelled and screamed, a CMO would have to go yell and scream. Right. And like an example, my mom, the one time, the only time she ever like got physical with someone was when he asked her to give uh, someone a, 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 like a slap because um, <laughs> he messed up, but just a light tap on the face. But that was like, his, his intention would have to go through the messenger, just as an example. <laughs> so, so go slap that person for me. Yeah, exactly. But that's like a one-time thing. It's just a funny thing, and I think yeah. the person actually laughed when it happened. What, I, I, that, that is weird. Now, one thing that is bizarre to me, I mean, I'm a parent, right? Mm -hmm. And um, CMO, originally back in 67, these were all real young teenagers, right? 13, 14? Yep, 12. sure were. 12, 13, 14, mostly females. There were a few males uh, that my parents talked about, but they didn't last very long. Um, you had to be able to withstand uh, someone talking down to you, I guess, and a lot of men, I would assume, would, would, would feel um, kind of, you know how men can be. Oh, yeah, like, young, yeah young men, like, hey, Commodore. Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of... Uh, they try to strut their stuff, right? And and that doesn't really work, I think, receiving orders, especially from someone like Alan Hubbard. Sure, and I could see a lot of young men telling them to go, go to hell. Um, exactly. <laughs> a lot more brave, right? So, <laughs> With so, the, yeah. Yeah. so your mother's on the ship Apollo. Mm -hmm. She's a member of the Commodore's Messenger Organization, and she's running around delivering orders. Uh, how does she, when the ship comes ashore, the Apollo came ashore in 1975, the Sea Org came ashore, mm -hmm. did your mother, she went to flag? I believe she, when it came ashore there in Miami, I believe, I think that's where they, end, or no, sorry, Day, Daytona. Daytona was where they're at, uh, like in a little place that everybody was staying at, and then Aaron Hubbard was off base somewhere else. Um, and it's supposed to be secretive, and then everybody was fired on missions to go set up, and the idea was Clearwater, and then that's when people went out, like my mom, to go and get the 
like any purchases or rentals done um, for them to set up in Clearwater. Yeah, and this goes to a very current story. You know, that we, uh, uh, David Miscavige, the leader of the church, just tried to buy a you know that 1.4 acre plot of land in Clearwater. Right. And there's always been acrimony between the city of Clearwater and the Church of Scientology because the Church of Scientology entered Clearwater under false pretenses as the United Churches of Florida. Exactly, yeah. They came in uh, with fake names, sometimes fake addresses, um, and just basically said they they didn't claim they were the Church of Scientology. Um, and that, I believe, it took uh, not too long to figure it out, but, I mean, it's over time, it's going to be figured out. So, just yeah. different people would figure out different times. Yeah, they 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 were um, exposed to uh, you know the the local newspapers uh, found out and exposed the church. Now, Brandon, wh what year are you, were you born? I was born in 1988. So by then, the church is well established at Flag. Where were your parents serving? At which time? Well, when you were born in 1988, were your parents... Oh, okay. Yeah, your... They were out in, I believe, 1982. So they had about a, a year and a half until they had my brother, Brett. And then, so they moved to South Africa, um, and then they had Brett, and then I was born in 88. So we were not born in the Sea Org, um, but uh, we probably... Would have I, I I don't know the the timelines of when the ranch was set up and when people were allowed to have babies, uh, but but yeah so we were born there and at that point that was after my parents got kicked out right and then so we were my parents got back on board they they did what they had to do for for the church to be okay with that and then they were kind of on the outskirts of Scientology. Uh, so that they could be in communication with my mom's side of the family who were still in and running a mission. So that's very typical, uh, to stay in the church so you can stay on good terms with your family. Um, now, when, you're, when your parents left the Sea Org in 1982, was this due to David Miscavige, you know, chasing your mother, who especially is CMO, out of the church? Or yeah, essentially it was more just, a, there were two groups, um, trying to figure out who was going to run it, right? It was, it was first established as, I believe, the Watchdog Committee to oversee um, pretty much everything to make sure that everybody's following their correct lines and terminals, right, and, and doing the correct orders that is coming from the top. Um, and then David uh, created another group, and they kind of took over uh, that position from uh, Dee Dee and Gail Reisdorf that were at the top of it, right? Right. Of, um, of the Watchdog Committee. And the CMO, I believe, as well. Uh, I forget who was on which post, but basically CMO and the Watchdog Committee were running the church, and then David essentially just ousted whoever were the connections or comm lines with those people that were in control so that he could just basically override and overrule. Um, so I think my mom's takeout was more just association, right, with Gail and Dee and being uh, married to my dad, Gary. And I think uh, there is just whoever was on this side, they're just going to get taken out, and then we're just going to replace. It's, so so Miscavige, whoever was not loyal to him, was basically driven from the church. Yeah, yeah, and there were made made up reasons why, made up stories, and uh, it's just unfortunate. Just the lies that were portrayed about these people were not true, and it's just funny how people either believed it or didn't believe it, but knew that they're staying in and they're just going to follow orders. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the handwriting was on the wall when when David Miscavige began to take power and became action chief. And uh, a lot of very good people left the church during that time. And then there was the Mission Holder Massacre and other things. So all that happened before you were born. Now, y your family had a mission. Mm -hmm. Where was it located? So that's the Norwood Mission in Johannesburg, South Africa, um, which was out of their house and still is out of the same property. Really? Um, mm -hmm. It's uh, just a side plot. It's a pretty big plot that they have. Uh, and they usually win the birthday game for all of Africa for the missions. Um, so they're 
a little bit more successful than the other ones, I guess. If I mean, in Scientology statistical terms, I guess I mean, we actually don't know, right? Yeah. What what the actual stats are, but um, yeah, so they are still still moving ahead. I know uh, uh, that they're. I'm sure that they're getting involved with the ideal org strategy and staffing up auditors and doing all that, just like everybody else is attempting to do. And usually, those are family members that are already in, right? Um, and close friends who whoever are clinging on. <laughs> hmm. Brandon, what I'm curious about, I want to ask you this question. Now, I, I was born into the Christian church. Okay. So back in the Stone Age, um, mm -hmm. before electricity and cars and things. No, anyway, a long time ago. And, <laughs> um, you know, I grew up hearing my early childhood memories are about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit and the Bible and going to church. Right. So when you're a child, that's all you know. I, I mean, I took it as self-evident because my parents and my family told me there's Jesus and there's God. And we would sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. You know, just the little kid. Right. Okay, so that's all I knew. What's it like to come into life as a Scientologist? What are you told? What are your early memories? Right. I think for us, it was more... My parents didn't really push anything on us or anything like that. Like once in a while, we'd have like a, like as a kid, right? I remember like being six or seven holding the cans, but they probably weren't even on. And mm. my my granny was doing a session with me, right? Or just asked me how, how I'm doing, having a conversation. But I think more so when you get older, um, the conversation comes up where you hear grownups talking about past lives and all of that. And at a young age, maybe being 8 or 9 or 10, even 12, 13, it's pretty risky for kids to start thinking about that kind of stuff, uh, especially what they're learning in science. And then they come here and they hear this, and people can start thinking and kind of looking in their mind. And I think for me, with my experience, that's kind of what was the downfall, was just getting too much into that kind of thing, like looking backwards, right? right. And in your past situation in life here and then kind of going along with that idea and making stuff up about a previous lifetime or whatever but what it can do to a child it just makes them almost too curious about it right yeah and it can cause trouble especially if there's no way to actually like no one could actually know that unless the kid told uh, like like talking to someone you can't really handle that so i think Growing up as a Scientologist, I think that's the biggest dangerous part. I mean, besides getting sucked into maybe join the Syria at a young age, but just learning these things that are cult-like, right, that are darker, and it's not mainstream, and it, it can do psychological damage. I think that is the biggest problem. And then once they get sucked into it, then they end up having auditing because the families are Scientologists, and then now you got a Scientologist. So oh, it's almost like a, a, a that's the dark way in my mind how kids could get sucked into Scientology, um, and it's not really talked about because I don't there's not too many second third gen generation Scientologists who talk about this or experience something like I had, but that is kind of what kind of shaped me to on what you saw in Leah Ramini's show is at the end there when I threw the hammer like I I was coming away from that and discrediting all my beliefs on what I thought I knew about myself or about life or the universe, and then now I'm doing great. So it's just kind of like, if you kind of see, it's not more, I wouldn't say what happened with me was a mental illness, but I think more it was just a culmination of that, and then now I've, I've discredited all those things in my head of what I believed, and none of that's happening where I don't like think about those things. <laughs> so yeah. it's very interesting how that could uh, happen to someone. Sure, you would have a, a a false sense of self. You'd have cognitive dissonance, conflicts. Yeah, uh, just disconnect with reality, right? That's the biggest thing. Your concentration, maybe the grades go bad. A kid gets involved with maybe smoking pot or something like that. I don't know. And, and then now they're on the periph, right? Like, <laughs> it, oh, wow. it's very easy for, I think, people, kids to fall into that trap being a, a kid in Scientology and then it's not really, because you know you're not going to get psychological help from a real doctor, right? There's right. That's not even an option. So in any situation in the kid's life, they fall down. That's the handling of that. 
is Scientology, and then you have these short little wins, they call it, quote unquote, that last a little bit, maybe, and and then now they're sucked in. Well, how old were you when you did your first purification rundown? Oh, for me, I was 16 and a half. Um, I, so I had a bunch of surgeries when when I was a kid, like ear surgeries uh, for the, I think they call them tubes here. Or sure, sure. Grommets, yeah. Um, and then I did a life repair, and then I flew back to San Diego. That was in when I was like, I think 17. I graduated high school, and then I didn't do Scientology until uh, I believe the introspection rundown. Um, and then I did that. That was like four or five years later. Yeah. And then, yeah. So at what point did your family move from South Africa to the United States? They moved. So we moved from South Africa in 1998. So I was 10 years old. What's it like coming to a brand new country from, I mean, you're a Scientologist and you're coming to America. Right. Was, I mean, what was it like for you to relocate to a different country? Well, for me, seeing South Africa, I mean, I was there when apartheid ended, oh, for one, right? Right. Uh, we had friends of family, like friends of extended family members, like they were getting murdered by uh, the, 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 the criminals out there. The blacks after apartheid ended kind of uprose a bit. It's still going on. Um, and people were getting killed for like their car or their wallet. And then we got robbed twice when we were um, on vacation. And so when we came back my dad my dad's like okay well we gotta like get out of here so then we basically moved for safety and i think the biggest thing i noticed here is the change is just how safe it is in america where you could just walk down the street like as a kid and play out front like that's not normal so but being out here i mean this is a lot better opportunities out here than out there but it's just there's a lot to talk about that's another whole conversation sure too. it is yeah the, the, the animals out there and I don't know. It's just completely different. <laughs> so, you, so you moved to a pretty peaceful place in San Diego. Very, mm -hmm. It's a lovely community. I mean, what, what's not to like about San Diego? When you get there, your family is uh, involved. Does, do you guys get involved with the local org, the San Diego? No. Org? No? No, not at all. They don't want to be on the main lines, right? Like the mission's pretty easy to just do a course or do a peer if and you're not going to get – like. I remember my address that I used for my mailing went to the the house or mission in South Africa. So I wasn't getting contacted by Scientologists. So my parents didn't want to really get involved with it. It was just to help, like I said, some situations that occurred um, that needed to be fixed for me. So, Well, you become a, a staff member of the San Diego Org. How, how did you get recruited? So that happened because... I didn't do my TRs, which is um, the the program that you do for. I mean, I don't know. It's just getting into the present time, right? Like that's one of the the steps after the PIRF, um, and it's a lot of processing. It's hundreds of hours, and so when I signed up for that, um, I was working, and but I was going to cut back my hours, and then they convinced me to be the bookstore officer, and I was in sales, so I would make five percent of whatever I could sell. And obviously, getting started, no one, I mean, there was no one to sell to. So that was kind of a dead uh, idea. And then I just got stuck on staff. And I don't want to just leave because then I'd have to pay a bunch of money and all that. And I just got stuck on it. And then over the course of that two and a half year period is just when everything just happened with Craig. And he kind of uh, told on to the church about what my parents have told him that either he didn't understand fully or only got partial, like a partial story or is too, or is like too young to understand. And, and so a lot of things were said that were false. Um, and this is from a long time of my parents telling us stories about David Miskovich and, and Aaron Hubbard. And basically it's just over time, it just culminated. And, um, and then I just left staff. I, I, I blew after they were declared. So I wasn't really active for a few months before that, though. Now, now, Craig, uh, is is that your brother? Yeah, that's my younger brother. Okay, so he sort he sort of um, tells the org some of these things, and they obviously there's knowledge reports and ethics and the whole nine yards. Exactly, exactly. And uh, this is so 
common in the church they, because it's a culture of spying family members, spying on family members and things. Um, now, the org itself, San Diego, not a lot is known about San Diego. It's supposed to be a big org. Does it have like 60 auditing rooms? Um, I think it's like, I think it's probably 45 to 50. I don't know about 60, but it's around that range. Um, yeah, they're a pretty good sized building, and it, it it opened a few months ago, I believe. Now, now, Brandon, was the San Diego org? Did it have a lot of PCs on course? Was it busy? So the only thing that was busy was the academy, where everybody was on uh, the TR's objectives or the survival rundown, quote unquote. And that's 22 and a half hours a week that you have to be on course. So that's the minimum. And it usually goes for about a year and a half, two years. And it, Wait, let me stop you, Brandon. Let me, let, me, sure. let me just stop. This is mind-blowing. So the survival rundown, or the SRD, is 22 and a half hours a week? Yep. That's yeah. the full intent. Like, it's the full amount that LRH said you have to have per week for it to work. Well, so if, if I'm working a full-time job, you know, and... 50, 60 hours a week. When I was in sales, you know, I, that was routine, 50, 60, sometimes more. So, right. so I, I, I couldn't imagine putting in 22 and a half hours on this. I wouldn't have any family life. I wouldn't have time for anything but work, be on course, and sleep. Exactly, exactly. And I was lucky enough to just do it on my weekends. So, uh, well, I was working one job then starting a business in a couple hours between staff. Then I was on staff from uh, 3 until like 11. Um, and on the weekends, I would be on course from 9 o'clock to 7 o'clock. And so those are my two days. And I'd probably fit in a three-hour course period one day a week or maybe twice. That's so nuts. that was my schedule, which was insane. Oh, it's nuts. I mean, well, now what is the survival rundown? What are you so busy with 22 and a half hours a week? I mean, what, do you, what does it consist of? So it consists of training routines to be able to be trained as an auditor to handle a PC, which is a pre-clear, which is a person getting like spiritual counseling. So you have to learn Hubbard's way to um, control that person to follow your commands and um, basically you're telling them to do something either by speaking or pointing. And it's basically there'll be a process that'll be specifically it's to handle a certain situation, let's say, um, that people run into. Maybe it's under, maybe it's like stopping the belief that everything happens for a reason. That was one of them. And that process would begin where you're basically pointing at objects in the room and you're saying a command um, and then on that command, it's basically like a question, and you're supposed to think with that command and react to it a certain way where you'll actually, at the end of the process, you'll realize that, oh, not everything happens for a reason. Maybe the person says it all the time, right? And they just untangle that belief where they change their mind on that belief. So, Well, well can we do a role play where, like, you're the instructor and I'm the PC? Sure. To get a, fla sure. To get a flavor, just give our listeners a flavor of, okay, so I'm the student and you're the instructor what happens i give an example okay so let's do hmm, like a locational okay oh, that's okay. a good one okay so a locational is is also one of the tr processes and that's to locate someone in present time and present time is where you're aware of the exact environment that's taking place around you you're not thinking about the past you're not thinking about the future your your awareness level is only on the environment and there's nothing else happening. So a lot of times people, something happens, they get in a car accident, let's say, and they're kind of disgruntled and they're not doing well and they're just maybe not physically, maybe physically they're fine, but spiritually they're kind of a bit down. Sure. So what this would do is I would start the session. So I'd say this is a session. And then I'd, we'd go over the commands and I would say, um, I believe it's, I forget now, but it's uh, look at that wall, I think it is. And then you would look at the wall, right. and then I'd say, thank you. And then I'd say, look at that tree, and then you'd look at it, and then you'd say, thank you. And during that time, a person's supposed to get worse and maybe start talking about the situation that's bothering them because they're 
looking at their surroundings, right? Right. And we talk about it, we go through it, you kind of squash it with the person, and then they start feeling a little better about it. I mean, you could do this by just having a conversation with someone. I don't know why you have to point and stuff, but <laughs> you continue going, and then at the end, they might have a cognition where they're like, oh, I, I feel like that it was the other person's fault. I don't feel bad about the car accident I was in, right? So, right. And then they feel fine, so it changes their mind, right? Just a little bit there. You see how they're, you're mind controlling someone. And then they feel good, and then they write their success story, how Scientology and Hubbard's technique has uh, fixed them on the situation. They feel good about it, and then they move on to the, like the next one, which could handle something else. So did it ever feel robotic or mechanical? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, more as an auditor because my PC or twin, I won't obviously say his name or anything, but uh, he had a lot of problems, and it's just he would drag on on some of the, like, one process, like the one I just talked to you about, that would go for, like, 50 or 70 hours. Oh, that's a, 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 unreal. You, you know, because I, I did TRs. I, I didn't do mm -hmm. a lot in the church, but I remember, like, touch the wall. Thank you. Touch the wall. Thank you. And, I mean, it got really kind of creepy for me, you know, or you know, it, it, there's a, a mechanical thing. I almost, I almost, I had this one weird thought in, um, when I was doing TRs. Mm -hmm. And because uh, it's repetitive, repetitive, repetitive. And, I, and I, it's like I got it. I got overran, to use a Scientology term. I'm in present time. I'm in the room. I don't need to do this. In fact, thank you. Touch the wall. And I would protest saying, I am in present time. I see the wall. You know, I see the floor. I, I, I've got it. I'm here. I don't need any more of this. Thank you. Now touch the wall. Right. And it was like they were trying to grind me down. And I, and, I, and I realized this isn't about being in present time because anyone can be in present time right now. Right. This is about getting you to mindlessly obey repetitive commands. And so, yep. So I did what's called, I ridged. And that's a Scientology term meaning resistance or put up a wall I ridged. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to do this anymore, okay? Right. I'm not, it's a waste of time. Thank you. Touch the wall. And they kept doing what's called 8C to control. Mm -hmm. and, and it was like this wearing down to where you capitulate and just do the damn commands so they'll, you, know, you can get through it. Mm -hmm. And that's the only re I realized the only way I could escape from this was to complete the course. Right. And what was so strange for me, Brown, and then I had to write a success story thanking L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> right. And I'm thinking, I remember, and I'll share, a, you know, a withhold, um, again, another Scientology word. I remember writing, a, I had to write a success story, and I didn't want to because I was going to write, this was really a stupid process in a course. I got nothing out of it, but I couldn't write that. <laughs> so, so I remember writing, sending to thank L. Ron Hubbard, but hoping it would never see the light of day or be published. Because what if, you know, one of my friends saw it, right? Right. <laughs> it was like this writing of success stories. And, and for new time uh, Scientology, uh, Scientology watchers, I will tell you, when you complete a course, you have to write a success story. And part of the reason why is if you ever leave, they can use it against you. Well, you said you liked Scientology and here's your success story. It's sort, of, right. it's sort of evidence, but it's also getting you to think that L. Ron Hubbard is the source of all this stuff. Now, some people Ooh. do have breakthroughs in TRs. I know people who said they were fantastic. Right. So. Well, and I think it, it, there's a lot of talking going on too, right? Well, talking from the PC and the auditor just acknowledges it mm -hmm. and kind of handles them and gets them back into the session. But if you're just talking about your problems that come up in your mind, that's going to happen throughout the day anyways, and usually most people talk to someone, right? Yeah. And, and you feel better, and, and that's what happens. So this is just an, like added steps are the physical movements that make it seem odd and weird, and then you're like, oh, my God, it's like a magic thing, but all you're doing is communicating. It's yeah. very simple. And, and this is funny because um, there are the people that you can tell, like they – you can see what they write and you know that it's like, oh, well, I don't know if he really feels that, you know, after looking at them. Um, but I think what changed is when the new Golden Age of Tech Phase 2 came out, um, David or RTC or whatever apparently discovered, quote-unquote, uh, the end phenomena for each thing. 
for each process that you're supposed to say along those lines that will now tell the auditor and the uh, CS that basically you've reached that point that we've been looking for. And so what would happen is now each process now has that, and there were hundreds that were released too that weren't being done before during the early days when Elrond Hubbard was just testing everything out. And basically people would just keep going on these these processes for hundreds, 20, 40, 50, 100 hours until they said those words. And, I mean, people were stuck on it for, I remember I audited my PC for 750 hours or 800. And that was just me auditing him, not him auditing me. And he's, so, pay, and he's paying the church to do this. Only a flat rate up front, which is $2,500 for the course. Um, but then... But then you're for doing in the academy. It's it's a co audit, so he's supposed to audit me. So it wasn't very smart that the church did this because people get sick of it and leave, or the church isn't making any money because they're not going. The the org didn't have any auditors, so it wasn't a very smart financial planning by the church. No, no, and and oh, not at all. And it puts you on the hook for you know seven hundred fifty plus hours. Now, something that's very interesting in the. Um, movie The Master by Paul Thomas Anderson Mm -hmm. uh, it's real fascinating because uh, the L. Ron Hubbard character Lancaster Dodd Mm -hmm. you know works with um, and this is played by the late Philip Seymour Hoffman works with Freddie Quell his PC and you see the scene where they're in the mansion and, and Freddie Quell has to touch the wall repeatedly Mm-hmm. And it gets pretty intense. So some of these Scientology processes can get pretty intense. Oh, yeah. They can get very subjectively intense. And did you ever have anyone just get really flip out on you doing this? Um, more crying and stuff like that and saying things I haven't told to other people, like being beaten by a family member or something like that, right? Or just something along those lines. But I did see other people in the academy while we are going. And they were having some issues, and basically, it's like watching a child. So your basic, what it's doing, it's probably hypnotizing someone a little bit, and it's it's causing them to to break down and and have a mental breakdown, and that's the goal. It's crazy stuff, and it's a lot of these processes. Remember, were canceled by Aaron Hubbard um, in the fifties during his uh, lectures that he did er, like early on, and um, David came and looked at everything and everybody looked at it and he, I guess L, what it sounds like Alan Hubbard told someone verbally to cancel an order uh, like one of the processes and then because it wasn't in writing from Alan Hubbard they they canceled all those cancellations um, and so the, that was during the times where I believe there were some news articles back in the 50s where people were actually during his testing, were like ended up in psychiatric hospitals. So that is a, a. I remember reading stuff about that, but that was during these processes. There were no CSs at the time. They would just come through a remimeograph and come through, and then the the course supervisor would have them run it, and, and then they'd send what happened back as a test, quote unquote. So that's what I was told by some old timers as well on that side. Yeah, and I've heard that as well. I have a. Uh some Scientology processes are designed to just wear people down and make them obedient, compliant. And mm-hmm. then they can create uh, mental disturbances. I have an article. I'm, I'm researching uh, early Scientology. I have an article from 1955, <coughs> and it, mm-hmm. it's, it's from the Arizona Republic newspaper, 17 May 1955. It says, okay. How, House Owner Sues Church. A $9,000 damage suit was brought yesterday in Superior Court here against L. Ron Hubbard by the, um, L. Ron Hubbard, the Church of Scientology, and others. And basically, it says the suit contends that this lady's house was extensively damaged by persons with seriously deranged minds who were placed there for care and treatment. So even in 1955, it looks like Hubbard was using what are called babysitting houses when people would flip out. Mm-hmm. And in this particular case in 55, uh, 
these deranged persons probably who were overrun on processes, um, you know, were had, he rented a house to lock them up in and they tore it apart. She sues for 4,500 in damages plus, plus um, actual damages of 4,500 for 9,000. So this has been going on a long time and this article tends to, you know, validate what old timers are saying. Now, switching gears at an org, the other, and what I really wanted to get into too, as you mentioned, you were involved in the ideal org fundraising, the credit card blitz, bridge loans. Yep. Like, let's get into money in an org and how everything rotates around money. Okay. Where, where does it start? Like, how does this whole ideal org fundraising start and what are you told to do? Well, here's what happens is that an org, you'll, like, the, the staff get frustrated because there's no public, right? And all these things are not being done correctly and blah, 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 right? All this drama is happening. And right. so the solution is, okay, guys, let's build a brand new building. We'll purchase it if we like it. We'll build on it, add maybe $10 million in upgrades and refurnish, ref, refurbishments. And then they'll come in and, and bring in Gensler, which is a contracting company, and they'll come in and build this brand new building. And the idea is that people in the real world or the WOG world, uh, they love shiny toys, right? Like, mm. like, like Apple iPhones. Like this is their Apple iPhone. And so oh, wait, it's like, wait, 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 let's stop right there. That's a really interesting thing I've never heard, Brandon. Yeah. So they believe that non Scientologist wogs like shiny objects. Yep. And sure so is. the ideal. Like a, mm -hmm. No, what you said that was genius. The ideal org is like Scientology's iPhone. Right. That right. So here it is. Right. You have the same software <laughs> plat, the same software platform that's been around forever. And just the phone just upgraded, and now the iPhone came out, right? Like the iPhone 8 just came out, and it's got a rounded screen. There's, it's all glass, and there's no home button, right? Like that's the new one that's coming out. And so it's still the same structure uh, internally, or right. the soft software, the iOS is the same, but it just becomes a prettier model. And it has to attract that cult-like person who's like, oh, my God, that's like beautiful, <laughs> it's materialistic, and... They'll come in, just the, the idea is they'll get drawn to these islands of, uh, what do they call it, the islands of hope or, or destiny, I forget what it is, but, yeah. Uh, or the, yeah, the ideal the island, and they get drawn in, and I even heard someone tell me once that uh, they'll always remember the ideal org building so they can come back next lifetime. <laughs> oh, man. That's like, that's like a shiny beacon, and I was like, oh my god, you guys are insane. But what's funny is that... Uh, Apple's value is $800 billion. They'll probably be the first trillion dollar company, you know, if you, yep. look, at, if you look at their capitalization, market capitalization. So I'm glad you told me it. Um, did they consider it like their, their iPhone? And so you raise, you're going to raise $10 million to get this building and, and stupid dead in the head wogs, homo saps are going to go in like fish to a shiny lure. <laughs> Yep, clamoring exactly. for Scientology. Okay, okay, right. Okay, so but now let's get the devil's always in the details. So right. You you've got to raise this ten million dollars from Scientologists. Right. And how is that done? How do you actually like go into San Diego and get ten million dollars? So, here's what happened first. One of the big Scientologists locally purchased uh, a building about fifteen years ago. Okay, he very well to do. Uh, I believe his company built guitars. And um, so he purchased it, and it was an old bowling rink. And I guess the powers that be afterwards, he, he was like, hey, here, I just bought this. It's big enough. And he didn't go through the proper channels, I guess, to get approval. And then about five years later, I guess, or even more, that um, was denied by the top, which would be probably David or his team that oversees that. And um, so that was a big problem for that family. And the public and everything is a big opinion leader. And then that was sold. Then they bought the fourth Avenue building downtown. And, um, that one, uh, was purchased, I believe for nine or 10 million. And then there's like 15 or 20 million, uh, total with the purchase amount, but the total for everything, including the upgrades was like 22 million, I think. Right. Um, and so that, I mean, you got to get 20, Two million people, well, minus ten, so twelve million people. Twelve, sorry, twelve million dollars is what you got to get 
from uh, maybe 150 people. So that's it was 300 people when they first started, but it went down to 150. But you can imagine how do you structure something like that. And so the only way is to get creative. And that's where kind of the gray area of financing comes into play. And uh, it's just crazy how this was structured. So people would get reverse mortgages, start renting, right, lease cars because they sold their cars. Uh, they would sell their properties and rent them out so they can uh, cover the mortgages and stuff like that. Pretty much anything you could think of. And then, so once they close someone, let's say I'm getting talked to and you get me to have the idea of donating, right? You find a reason personally to me in my life that would the ideal org would fix and right. whatever that could be. And once they have that, they tug on that. And then basically, once they agree to donating, then they figure out how much based off of their financial plan. Your financial plan is your debt to income ratio, how much space you have to pay for more debt, right? Or, or purchase things. So what they do is they would figure out the best way. Is it getting credit card uh, ex extensions on your limit? Is it applying for new credit cards? Is it getting a, someone to buy all your debt and then have a loan with them? Or just a personal loan with someone or a credit card on someone's credit card, right? And then you just pay them every month. Um, and so what they would do is go through your credit cards, try upgrade them to get more credit, and they do it in a short amount of time so the credit bureaus don't get a notice of too many inquiries because that'll hurt your credit. I think it's three or four until you get flags and stuff sure. and they, they, they shut you off. So people would be getting anywhere from 10 to like 60 or 80,000 on top of what they already have and then they'd either loan it out or use that to live for a while or donate it, right? Um, and so it's really interesting because they're, force it, they're basically making you do it. So you basically have a church, a so-called church, uh, which mm -hmm. is really you're getting down into the nitty-gritty of giving them your finances, and they're looking at how much debt they can take on and how to scam credit card companies. And this is why I've used the term, I've said on my Scientology Money Project, that the Church of Scientology is a wealth extraction scheme. Yep. It's designed purely to extract wealth from its members. Mm -hmm. under, the, under the guise of religion. And now, one thing you said, um, and that's that, so they're doing a credit card blitz, which we talked about before the show. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it mean? You, you, you gave me an interesting note here. I was so fascinated by the term. Putting it into the universe by paying now? or What's, right. the, what's the phrase? Paying now. So basically, you're putting it out there, right? You're um, putting your theta out there, they call it, which is like your, when people like ask the universe for something like, oh, I want to see a sign from the universe, right? So in order to make that happen a lot quicker, what they do is like they, everything's done in Scientology thinking is flows. So energy flows, money flows, uh, communicating, you're, you're flowing when you're communicating, right? So right. when you pay a dollar or five dollars or ten dollars and you're getting people to do that, maybe 20 or 30 people constantly, then the bigger deals like that they're working on, maybe 100,000 can come off, right, and actually happen. And it just pushes all that. We're all going towards the same goal. So what they kind of do is they kind of have you look at everything and then they, you decide to donate, let's say, 10,000. You do these little flows throughout the day and then they find someone which is not, they're not supposed to do that per their own policies, but they'll find someone to loan you the money for that amount short term, maybe 60 days, maybe it's cash or it's on their Amex card. I had that happen once for like 20 grand. And so they give you 60 days to pay that off. And then they say, look, you put it in the universe, it's there. You know you're going to find a solution now. And now you're forced to go find a loan to pay off that guy's Amex or pay back the cash. And that's a long term loan, harder to get, right? Right. Um, and so I was stuck with about 65000 in debt, not for ID.org, but for the L. Ron Hubbard Hall that they're do donating for right now in yeah. Florida. But same thing, I got bridge loans, and then I couldn't find a loan. 
So oh. my income started going down because I was on course and I was doing this and trying to figure it all out. I stopped, like I was almost like stopped working. So then I couldn't afford the monthly payments for the loan, right? So I got stuck with these short-term loans. And But the thing is, the other thing I mentioned to you on our email there is that um, we you kind of look at the the situation and if you can't make the the bills you're screwed so yeah. so you're difficult you're, you're, you're no kidding you're a young guy they've got you sixty thousand dollars in debt but here, right here's, but here's the thing though the the kicker is the money doesn't come from me it's coming from someone's credit card paying directly to a church i never touch the money per the loan rules or laws or whatever you're supposed to, there's escrow accounts when you purchase a house, right? That money you own for a certain amount of time when it's passing through the bank, goes to escrow, it gets exchanged with the person that's selling you the house, right? Right. Here, it's, they're having someone who will loan, come tell you, hey, we have a short-term solution, can you do it? Sure. Nothing really in writing. They make the payment. Now there's, hey, was it really my fault or did you guys kind of just set up a loan, <laughs> right? So that's what it looks like. So there's also that gray area too. They're not following the actual rules of money, so they're bypassing the system. Sure, and and you know, there's an old country western song about a guy who gets divorced, and the line is, "She got the mine, and I got the shaft." And <laughs> and, and it, it reminds me of this because basically, the church gets the cash, you get the debt, and so the yeah. the debt's your problem, and. I mean, to be blunt, this has always been one of the church's biggest fuck you to its parishioners. Oh, yeah. And I well, mean, I mean, yeah. it really is. It's like, fuck you. We've got your cash. You're not going to get it back. The debt's your problem. Go create it. Go open some flows with the universe. Right. Well, it gets worse in San Diego. Basically, they finish the fundraising, right? It's 19, 20 million or whatever. So, three or four months later, the building sort of started, and then they come back and say, hey, these new environmental laws just changed like in January and now we have to put these sensors on the windows to determine how much light there is to lower the light bulbs so we're not wasting too much energy. And they came up with like 1.8 or 2.2 million extra when in actual fact one of the staff members, an electrician, said it probably only cost his company to do it for 50000 So oh, now, wow. they're, now they're coming back and all these people that have just been crushed financially – at their brim, half of them are probably gone and left, right, are now tasked to come up with another couple million. So what they devised was they broke basically everybody into two groups, and there was like 500,000 left, so they got two big donors to loan out $250,000 for each group, and you had like 20 people in each group paying a monthly payment towards this mega loan to finish the fundraising. And you're basically putting the trust in that everybody's going to be able to pay it. And so one by one, I'm I'm assuming there's less and less payments being paid towards this. And it's probably, I don't know, it's some weird pyramid scheme that they created, which doesn't really make anybody else win besides the church. So Well, here's what bothers me about that is um, <clears throat> there's no financial transparency in the Church of Scientology. So if I'm a parishioner in San Diego or anywhere else and I say, hey, I'd like to do an audit of the books on the ideal org spending, I can't, right. I can't. I don't get to see the books. I don't get to see what they're spending per square feet. Now, what I've done, um, what I've done is, is to look at some of their um, – there's a company called Nova HRC. You can put in Google Nova HRC. Okay. And they're the company that does renovations and construction for the Church of Scientology. So Gensler will do the plans and designs. Nova HRC actually does the build. And some yeah. of the, some of the uh, on Nova's HRC website, they give projects and they show price per square foot for renovation of like the Fort Harrison and and right. you know, Saint Hill and other properties. And the church is actually spending more money per square foot on renovation in the Ritz-Carlton and Laguna Beach. The, wow. no, the numbers don't make sense to me. And you don't know if there's padding put on. You don't know anything. Right. I've been in business. I, I know how 
you have cost of goods for things and you can make a side deal, right? And you can pad the numbers and get paid uh, without the other side knowing. So uh, I totally get that. I well, well, That's a good point. Especially when you're dealing with um, exotic materials like, say, zebra wood from Africa or you're bringing in marble from Italy. You, right. You can just say what it costs when you bring it in. You could pad and I'm not saying that's going on, but I'm saying it's suspicious when you start seeing what's basic. Uh, look, an ideal org is, a, is an office building normally. And for new listeners, an org just means a church, a Scientology church. And these are just office buildings, but I call them glorified office buildings. Yeah. They're, they're often in like in industrial parks and things. And there's some of the costs I've seen, and I, I, I've been around construction in the 80s I did a lot of large-scale lighting retrofits and high-rises and big multi-million square foot properties like um, the Sky Chef's Kitchen at LAX million square feet and I had kind of have a good feel for it and, I've, and, and I kept up on it so it's just suspicious to me that it costs so much money for remodeling because if you have a 10 million dollar building you're not going to put 10 million dollars into it at that point, it'd be better to buy a brand new twenty million dollar building. Right. So, so some some of the things they do financially seem completely screwball to me. And I did want to mention one thing, to uh, just by way of educating our listeners, Scientology will often ask people to make pledges. Right. Mm -hmm. How much will you pledge? And there used to be a thing that, that they made it illegal, but it was postulate checks. We'll make a postulate, write us a $10,000 check today and just postulate that the money will come in. Oh, my God. And that went on in the 70s, postulate checks for your bridge. Well, that's technically what they're doing with the credit cards. Is you just got to make a go-right. That's the new thing. They don't say postulate. They more say just, you just got to make a go-right. We can do it right now. You've obviously already told uh, – you made it known that this is possible because the money is being offered to you right now. So you'll figure out the other stuff. you just got to make it go right. So the make it go right is so criminal. I'll give you an example. The church uses this for everything. And, like, I, I was interviewing Matt Pesh, who, who was, you know, an executive at Flagland Base. Mm -hmm. And he would talk about how down in that humid climate, people would get foot fungus. Because they're hmm. you know they're working 16, 18 hour days and they don't change shoes. Right. And this happened to Mark Hadley. He was wearing the same pair of shoes 18 hours a day and his feet smelled and he thought it was some permanent condition. When he left the Sea Organ, he had several pairs of shoes and he didn't have to wear the same pair of shoes for a week straight. As you know, the foot problem, you know, the odor straightened up. Yeah. <laughs> but but when people would get foot fungus and flag in the humid climate of Florida, they would be told, "We'll make it go right." Yeah, what does that mean? Like, okay. It, 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 it's, it's a non-answer. It's an evasion of responsibility. But they're trying to make it sound like you're a Satan, you're an OT, whatever. You're a Scientologist. You can make it go right. So we've got your $10,000, so beat it. You go make it go right and pay that money. Well, yeah, there's that. And then when you say no, they come back and say, well, we're saving the planet. What are you doing, man? Like, you got to make it go right. That's what I do all day. Oh man, like, that's a big invalidation. We're saving, yeah. we're saving the planet, and you're wor and you're bothered about a ten thousand dollar bill. Oh yeah, donations. We're saving the planet. Like if you donated a hundred thousand dollars, that's better than passing out, like a hundred people passing out a hundred thousand booklets. Like there's more. If you got like banquets and you get awards and trophies, and it's like a whole it's a whole show. And you're saving the planet. Those are the most special people there are. So, but you know what's funny, uh, Brandon is um, the Scientology talks out of both sides of its mouth, so that um, Sea Org members will often look disdainfully upon publics as being dilettantes because they won't mm -hmm. sign that billion-year contract, right? Right. These these public Scientologists are thiedy weedy dilettantes. Mm -hmm. They're not serious about saving the planet, or they would be with us. Right. And yet when the church wants money. They'll appeal to, be, appeal to these public dilettantes who have an income that we need you to save the planet. Give us money. Right. <laughs> it's kind of, exactly. It's part of the schizophrenia of Scientology. Um, so, well, yeah, there's that. But then how they sell it, too, is they're like, look, if you do this and we open the building, 
And when Scientology Media production comes out, or Sump, as Mike calls it, right, um, they will uh, do a commercial in San Diego. You'll have three and a half million people view it, and we expect about half a percent of those people to actually call for more information. And I think it was like 34,000 people will be lining out the door. Like, we'll need 10 ideal orgs to handle everyone. Oh, That's that the delusion. That's what they're selling. <laughs> <laughs> and as you know, I mean, we, we'd probably all be aware if there were people lining up around the door. And it's open. It's been open for a few months. And I, I always knew it was just BS what they're trying to sell. But that's the Sea Org members, right? They're also living another reality. So they're delusional. And then they just make everybody else delusional. And then we're all just all crazy. And they'll do anything. I mean, once you got a public eating off your plate, I mean – it's pretty easy to control them until they're they're done, or sure. it's, or the, or they make it. They figure out something that works, and they make more money and they survive. Right? That's usually who are in are the people that can make their bills and they still have their family. That's probably who's left. Oh, Scientology pushes people to make money, no doubt about it. So you've got an entrepreneur class who you know has the money to put up a million dollars for a glorified bowling trophy. Okay, Brandon, you, this is the most interesting data point I've heard that's hard, you know, from someone who was in the Sea Org. So they told you that 3.4 million people in San Diego would see the TV commercial. Right. And that there would be a half percent response. Half, I believe, is a half percent response, yeah. And so then it comes out to, whatever comes out to 34,000 people is what I was told that they expect off of their numbers that should be contacting the org the reason i wanted to, to focus on this for a minute uh brandon is is this finally gives me some breakthrough like me john p capitalist other people that follow the money mm -hmm. if they're actually projecting a half percent response it shows how low their threshold is because if, right. you're, if you're investing 20 million dollars hoping to get 34,000 people to come. In the real world, that's not going to happen. You and I both know it. The Church of Scientology knows it. David Miscavige knows it. Right. Their, their response rate, I guarantee you, is not a half percent. The, the Ideal Org program failed. David Miscavige put his personal prestige at stake on these orgs, and they have failed. Yep. So when you left... When you left the this, this, this staff as a staff member, what was the state of San Diego? Was it worse than before when you started? Were people yeah, well, they, they, of course. I mean, they came back with the second round of fundraising, right? That ended. Then recruitment started. When recruitment starts, they bring a team of people, some CERG members, to recruit. And it's a, all hands-on now. It's not just money. Money's done now. Now we need them to work. So they just gather all as much people as possible uh, that are public um, and family members and stuff that maybe aren't Scientologists. And then they put ads out on Craigslist and just get a bunch of random people started. And that's the next phase is to now join staff. And so now they've got your money, right? And now they've got your time. And so now these people are going to make more money for this organization by now saving the planet with their little iPhone. <laughs> it's just amazing. So they, they build it, then they have to recruit people to staff it. Yep, they got to recruit people to staff it, and then uh, they will do the advertising. And, and so that's when, like, other staff members will say, hey, I just went to San Francisco Org, and they're empty, and they've been ideal for a few years. They'll say, well, we haven't launched Scientology Media Productions. So that's how they got around the empty orgs, was that they haven't launched the marketing part. We're first in danger. Our place looks like a morgue, right? We need it to look nice. And now they put the staff in, and, and now Sump is supposed to come and basically spread Scientology to everyone, Can to me, the masses, to the billions. Let me get this straight, because this is re really interesting. Okay. Now, 10 years ago or more, the carrot they dangled before Scientologists is if we build the ideal orgs, they will come. Right. 
However, the ideal orgs remained empty, and they said, oh, we have to open Scientology Media Productions and do commercials. Right. And then they'll come. Right. And <laughs> we just need advertising. And, and, when I, I, and what's interesting is Scientology Media Productions. Okay, now, here's, here's what's really funny to me as a businessman. Um, KCET sells them an old lot for $45 million that needs a lot of work. Right. Right. I mean, it needs millions and millions. They have to remortar all the bricks. You know, I mean, it's like a historical building. It's an old, like, 19- yeah, it's over 100 <laughs> years. It's the oldest uh, production <laughs> studio in all of L.A. It's like you're buying uh, the, the the place that's being filled with homeless people down the street, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so they buy this. They buy this lot, the KCET lot for 45 million. They sink tens of millions of dollars into it. And KCET keeps the broadcasting license. To me, I laugh because it's almost like KCET saw these suckers coming. Like, let's unload this whole lot on them, move on to Oh, and then they keep the broadcasting rights, so they (laughs) earn all this money off it. Exactly. KCET keeps the best part because the pure gold is the broadcasting license. Right. But don't you think there could be some uh, inflated (laughs) numbers there, too? And. A, a nice way to launder some money on the back end. I I don't I don't know. You know I I looked over KCET's 990s and it all uh-huh. looked, it all looks straightforward to me. Hey, look, getting that big property in Hollywood at 45 million. You know I would have went somewhere else because if you need a studio, I I, I would have like went to Santa Clarita. You know maybe gotten a bigger, better, you know more modern place, but. As it buying the land in and of itself, it's okay, but it's like, you know, in Scientology, talk, they talk about an almost. Mm-hmm. Buying a studio without getting the broadcasting license is an almost. And the big, yeah. the big failure that uh, Mike Rinder, Tony Ortega talked about is Miscavige now announces they're going to buy time on Spectrum. It's like, wait a minute, anyone, any WOG, any stupid WOG can buy time on Spectrum cable, right? Right. You and I could go have Jeff and Brandon's special show, and we could go buy time. Right. That, that's a no-brainer. You got money. It's like buy- infomercial type yeah, slots. Yeah, we, we could go sell whatever we wanted on. You know, yeah. So <laughs> so I thought it was really funny. <laughs> They're like, what an epic fail. You're buying time. You didn't even need to sink the $45 million plus into KCET if you're just going to buy time. Oh, no. They're also, I mean, commercials are one thing, but what they're going to do with the commercials is they're going to take, when there's a psychiatric ad on television, they're going to pay for the commercial before and after for the truth about drugs and the the CCHR. Um, (laughs) And that's their way of combating psychiatry is is doing that. So they're going to book in anti-psychiatry ads. Now, but see, if if I'm a big pharma drug company, I'm going to tell CBS or ABC or whomever, hey, look, I'm going to pull my ads if you're going to do this. That's an inherent, inherent conflict of interest for you to sell me airtime and then sink me on either side. I'll go to another network. Thank you. Right, and that's probably what will happen, but that's another carrot, right, for these Scientologists is, oh, my gosh, we're actually going to fight psychiatry, like, on the big stage. And so it, <laughs> and then so maybe they'll have airtime. We know Kirstie Alley is going to be on TV, she said. So you can make, expect her and Tom doing infomercials for Scientology, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I was told they're going to even have sitcoms on there and stuff, like Scientology-related. So I don't know what's true or not. Well, what, what, what else did they tell you about Scientology Media Production? So sitcoms? Sitcoms, commercials, right, with the psychiatry. Um, what else is there? Uh, just showing all the 4D campaigns, so stuff they do for humanity, quote-unquote, that they supposedly do. And, and so that's going to be showing full-time. Uh, and then commercials about it will be displayed in ideal org areas to pe- people to go to the channel. So it's more just parading all their positive stuff. They actually believe this is going to happen. That's that's the shocking part. And I don't know how far that that goes up the chain where people are believing that. Yeah, so the sequence is donate money for ideal orgs. Oops, now you need to donate money to for our uh, Scientology Media Productions mm-hmm. broadcasting. 
Mm. And then when that fails, they'll be like, oh, we need to get our own satellite. Let's launch the Miscavige 1 satellite into orbit. That will infiltrate the media or you know, so something. I don't know. Well, yeah. well, well it's, it's always a, a mirage that's, you know, vanishing. As you head toward it, it vanishes. <laughs> yeah. Like OT9 and 10, right? People are prepaying for that. And it's just every year it's going to be happening and never happens. <laughs> well, it only it only took like 20 years to open the superpower building in Florida. And yeah. what, what what was funny, you know, this this is a big office building. Basically, you could build it, oh, let's say two years, two and a half at the most. I mean, it's not that hard, right? It's just, you know, you, you get the foundation, pour, uh, throw up the steel, you know, I mean. All right. Okay, but they took 20 years, and their excuse for taking this long was, well, it takes decades to build. It took decades to build the great cathedrals of Europe. I go, well, yeah, but they were cutting stone by hand, and they didn't have any machines or cranes. You can't. Anyway, a lot of a lot yeah. of their stuff is just idiotic in the extreme. Right. How long? I mean, how much did it really cost for one? Right. And for two, why was it taking so long just to maybe spend more? <laughs> you know. Who knows? But I don't know. Well, well, Brandon, since you've since you've left uh, the Church of Scientology and you're out of it, mm -hmm. you know, what are you doing with your life now? How what what's going on? So I'm surfing quite a lot, two or three times a week. Um, working out here and there. I play soccer a bunch, um, play golf once in a while. But I also started a medical sales company, or I work for myself, the sole proprietorship. But basically, I I broker laboratory deals like blood tests, toxicology and DNA tests with marketing groups who send their doctors patients tests to my laboratories that I broker. And then I would get a share of the reimbursement. So I'm, I'm doing that. I, I'm giving myself about uh, like about six months to give it a shot. I was doing it before all this happened last year. Um, and I'm just give it takes a while to get paid by insurance and stuff. Sure. So I'm just being an entrepreneur. Um, and if it doesn't work out, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's going to work out, but if it doesn't, I'm going to, uh, probably get a job somewhere in sales, but, uh, I'm, I'm hoping this is working. So continues going successfully. Well, I hope it works for you. And part of the part of entrepreneurship is taking risks. And I applaud you for taking risks. A lot of people aren't willing to do that. Well, it just and shows. I mean, it shows how great my parents are to let me do this, right? So sure. that's uh, they're two of the most credible people I know. So well, your folks are yeah. great people. But you never look. You know, the beauty of leaving the church is you never have to look back. You're young. You have your whole life ahead of you. Yep. And exactly. to people like you who are second or third generation who are still stuck in the church and want to get out, what would you say to them? I would just say just look for yourself, right, and what's actually being told to you um, and listen to other people's point of views and not just have a safe terminal is what they call it in the church where they handle all your problems. Let other people that are not around you give you assistance too and just listen to what they think about things that are going on in your life because um, they'll give you the correct answer not fix it with Scientology and I think that's the biggest thing is they suck people into this terminal quote unquote one person to handle that person parents all go they know that that's the person that's working with that your child um, so I think that's the biggest thing is just getting other people's opinions and that's just being open minded so that right there just proves that being in your closed minded. And I think that's the biggest thing that I did is I started looking online. I started reading Mike's blog before my parents really started. And I just read a few things about some of the South Africans who have left the church uh, when that happened a couple of years ago. And um, I was, that's when I started questioning everything. And then I was stuck on staff, even though I really wasn't working. So that's my advice is just slowly pull yourself away from it, even if it involves, you know, debts that you owe. Um, if it involves family members, you just got to go with the bulk of your family because, you know, you don't want to be the one stuck inside with no one, right? So that's what I did. And, and I appreciate you saying that because in the end, all we have is family. And, yep. you know, the old saying, blood is thicker than mud. Your family is more important than anything else. 
And right. If, if this church wants to break up your family or take you away from your family or disconnect you, then what kind of church is it really? It's not. And that's why we have a word for it, and that word is called cult. And that's why Scientology is a cult, because it breaks up families. It bankrupts, exactly. Yeah, it bankrupts people. It lies to people. Right. And, Brandon, I'm so glad you survived your ordeal of growing up in Scientology and finally broke free of it. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it was a weird way to, to exit, but um, with going to jail and the hammer and all that nonsense, but I'm glad I'm through it. I mean, as you can tell, uh, family is everything and losing Craig. I mean, I... I would have done a lot more if I could, but, you know, there's limitations on what you can actually do in the world to, uh, I, I don't have a hundred thousand dollars to, to sue them. Right. Uh, but what am I going to assume? I mean, there's, there, there's just so much I could have done so much more, but I'm limited to what I could actually do with what I've available. Well, Brandon, like they say, we, we have to play the cards life deals us. Right. And considering what you, you've been through, the fact that you survived and came out stronger and you are exactly. and you are speaking out and making a difference so, so that other young people can hear i applaud you for that it takes a lot of courage when you gain life experience it's, it often comes at a very high cost right but if you learn the lesson and persevere and go on you're stronger for it and i, I know agree. i know so many people have gone through hell in scientology and they they my what i would say to them is You'll get through it. You'll emerge out the other side of the tunnel stronger. Yep. And I concur. And then you'll you'll learn real freedom. And looking back on it, what Scientology calls freedom is actually slavery. Right. The freedom is actually when you leave. And, and that's the one thing I noticed is after all this, I can go surfing. I can play soccer. can go golfing. I can start a business. I don't have to be in debt. I can have a girlfriend. I, I can have a weekend, right? Like these are things that they don't have. And that's what I started seeing is when my time disappeared and was taken up by them, that's when I knew at a certain point, I was like, Oh my God, like they've got me completely. I have no life. And that's when I was, I rejected it. Some people just stay in and succumb and join the Sea Org or continue. But that's kind of what, I noticed was my time was gone. That's and, the biggest thing. And now that you're out, your time is yours to control. Exactly. And and that is freedom. Well, Brandon, I'm so glad you came on to the show today. Look forward to you're having welcome. you. You're oh, welcome. Oh, look forward to having you on again. And thank you for all your insights and for Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Thank you for listening. And as always, we'll be in very good touch. <laughs>